so we're going to talk about the digital euro. And for this, uh, I'm happy to welcome Ulrich Benzal, the Director General at the ECB, who will speak about the report that the ECB published on, on this. So we will see if Ulrich is with us. Yes, thank you very much, Eileen. And uh, thanks uh, to the panelists also from my side and to Fiona. It was great to listen uh, to the discussion. And I'll try now to share my screen, right? I don't think I'm enabled. I'll try, but... Um, I'm trying, I'm trying. One second. You are being made the presenter now, so you should be able to now. Okay, yes. There you are. Yep. So you can see the presentation? Yes. I can maybe... Yeah. Is it better now? Is it big or...? No. Uh, no, okay. I have to share the other screen. One second. Sorry, give me one more. Or, or let me maybe continue like this. I have I have three screens, so I'm a bit okay. Maybe let me let me start if it's big enough to see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, digital euro and transformation of payments. The the panel already started really discussing this. So we have uh, new new kids in town. We heard about, of course, big techs uh, entering the market. We have EPI as a very important initiative. And then we may have a digital euro, um, maybe sometimes in the future. So as you as you know, we published um, a report um, just, uh, I think, on 2nd of October. The ECB published its digital euro report which uh, explains uh, it, its thinking, really. And of course, my presentation will be based uh, on this um, on this uh, report. And I mean, let me not go now through the presentation overview. Let me start uh, directly again with what uh, do we mean by a digital euro? It's a central bank liability or call it central bank money available in digital form for use in retail payments which is, of course, for citizens, but also for non-financial uh, companies. Again, one more time, it would complement and not uh, substitute uh, cash. I think the ECB is uh, saying that uh, at every occasion. So uh, Monique's uh, plea, I think, is uh, fully taken up. Um, of course, some people may see, uh, I think, gets close to conspiracy theory saying that uh, the digital euro is at the end a mean to discontinue banknotes, but that's uh, really not the case. I think the uh, communication is very clear on that. Secondly, um, there is um, the idea to maximize uh, synergies with the industry, not to reinvent the wheel, not to reinvent um, many things that the industry has uh, successfully deployed over the last uh, decades and which uh, the central bank should, for efficiency reasons, not uh, replicate. And uh, and then, yeah, the digital euro has not been necessary so far. There are scenarios under which uh, it will become uh, useful and maybe necessary. And um, that uh, that is explained in the report what those main scenarios in the view of the ECB uh, would be where this uh, assessment would, uh, would change. And again, as a previous speakers here have been saying, and Fabio Panetta has been saying, and uh, our president has been saying, the uh, the ECB, the euro system needs to be prepared because the scenarios under which then an issuance uh, of digital euro makes sense can materialize maybe even faster than we now uh, believe. So, um, yeah, what are the main benefits uh, of a digital euro? In, in uh, short, the long version is, uh, of course, in the uh, report. So, first, um, the digitalization of the European economy. I think that has also been uh, mentioned several times uh, in the panel. The, um, the um, sorry. The uh, uh, EU digital um, single market uh, agenda is, uh, you know, 
very consistent with uh, with that idea no that um, we have a digital euro serving the economy so maybe this point goes uh, even beyond uh, citizens and consumers it would be a, a tool also for the economy and there are terms like the programmable um, programmable money or programmable CBDC uh, are mentioned in industry uh, circles as also you know being supported potentially by a digital euro um, then there's clearly the scenario of a declining use of cash as a means of payment again you know regardless of the central bank's uh, commitment to issue uh, digital um, sorry non-digital uh, cash so banknotes without time limitation uh, still, you know, usability of cash can uh, can go down, and uh, and Sweden has been one example for that. So, if we extrapolate uh, this development to the euro area, then let's say the usability of central bank money would decline, even if we would issue uh, cash, even if the stock of cash would continue to be significant, it wouldn't, uh, you know, guarantee that um, that it can be used. Uh, moreover, you know, just from the um, growing share of e-commerce and things where already now you cannot use cash, obviously, you may want to preserve, let's say, the ability of citizens to rely on central bank money as a further option in addition to commercial bank money. And uh, last but not least, and that has been also mentioned uh, many times in the panel and in the speeches, uh, tackling uh, sovereignty concerns relating, I mean, he had mentions foreign CBDC, which is uh, maybe also um, a futuristic, um, let's say, concern, but more concretely, um, as the, the panel members also insisted on, that um, there are already now, let's say, there is a dominant uh, market share and market concentration of uh, non-European uh, retail payment providers in an area, let's say, of high uh, strategic importance, of high importance for citizens, for the economy. So their um, uh, digital euro would be another, let's say, pillar of sovereignty, in addition, of course, to uh, European uh, private sector solutions that uh, we talked about in the in the panel. So we uh, the euro system needs to be prepared to be ready to deploy those benefits, in particular under certain scenarios. And the euro system, the ECB, is not um, unique, of course, in this. So it's a global, let's say, phenomenon of central banks to uh, study CBDC. So a BIS report found that 80% of central banks globally are engaging in CBDC work, and here just to mention, you know, big uh, the big players, the People's Bank of China has been one of the early movers here, and uh, started to study CBDC in 2014. It started uh, live experimentation and uh, local and focused uh, deployment of CBDC in uh, 2020. And here, what uh, Javier Santa Maria has been saying, Rome has not been built in one day seems to apply also for CBDC, looking at uh, the time the People's Bank of China has also taken uh, to work on this. And um, yeah, the Federal Reserve System has also, let's say, joined, uh, joined the club recently. We have joined the club. And um, another, let's say, interesting maybe publication is uh, one by the BIS of a group of uh, seven central banks. I think that was uh, published also on the uh, 9th of October. So it uh, gives you some, uh, let's say, common views of uh, seven uh, central banks, including the Fed, um, the Bank of Japan, and the ECB on CBDC, including on international um, questions. So um, here that is um, just to put again the, um, you know, the nature of uh, CBDC next to you know, the one alternative and one thing that is not an alternative. So um, CBDC is a liability of the central bank. 
it is um, you know that is a differentiation to a private means of payments, which are a liability of a private entity. And of course, you had already now um, central bank money, as you know, cash in the form of banknotes was uh, accessible to the general public. And there was also a digital form of central bank um, money, which were deposits um, with the central bank, uh, with uh, the euro system. But that uh, access to this type of deposits was limited essentially uh, to, um, to banks. No? So in a certain way, CBDC combines uh, the two in the sense we have a general public access, but we have the digital, the digital form. Um, so private entity liabilities, commercial bank money is well known, is available in digital uh, form, is deployed in, in, in many variants. Of course, you have e-money, you have, uh, you know, payments with uh, cards, you have uh, then maybe as an intermediate uh, thing moving further away from commercial bank money is uh, stablecoin projects that um, entail a liability of an identifiable entity. And that is no longer the case if you move then to the right. So Bitcoin, pure crypto assets is not a liability of anyone. It is just an asset. It is not linked in terms of value to uh, any monetary unit. It therefore fluctuates and is uh, not, let's say, has only to a very limited extent the properties of money and is something therefore completely different. So what has to be uh, done towards, uh, you know, being able to issue central bank a digital currency, a digital euro? So maybe in this, uh, in this uh, chart, I would suggest to uh, start with uh, the lower middle panel. So we have, no, sorry, with the two, um, with the end user perspective and the legal issues. No, that's really the starting point. Of course, everything has to take place within a legal framework and, uh, and with or without, let's say, further uh, legislation to be uh, confirmed. And then we have the end user perspective, which of course has to drive everything a CBDC should have, uh, you know, uh, maximize uh, the usefulness for the user. There has to be a value proposition for users. So the end user perspective has to be really studied and understood. Then we can move to design decisions and the design decisions then, you know, are first of all the functional design decisions. And then on that basis, we can move uh, up to um, then the technical uh, design, no? And the technical design, if you want, has three elements, a back-end infrastructure, then a front-end uh, infrastructure, and then, you know, various, let's say, issues relating to the distribution framework, really the front-end that will be um, the access point of uh, consumers or of firms. There will be the question how digital euro and commercial bank money will be uh, exchanged against uh, each other. So all those things then need to be uh, studied in detail. And uh, yeah, they are quite multi, multi-dimensional and, uh, and non-trivial. So a very careful uh, analysis is, is needed here. And the question again, how will this uh, new kid in town really, or how would it um, interact with uh, the private initiatives and the ECB really feels the digital euro is a complement and not a competitor primarily to private initiatives. So, so why is that? So, um, first of all, you know, the payment, the digital payment market is a, is a gigantic market and it is a growing market. And if we assume, you know, the scenario that digital payments will take a, a never increasing share in total payments, then you know there's ample space for coexisting in the same sense as there are, there's coexistence now at the point of sale between a cash payment and digital payment. Yeah, so let's say the um, digital euro would uh, come into play also when anyway there would be more migration 
from uh, cash payment to digital payments. So in, in so far, crowding out of uh, private players is not uh, a necessity at all in this growing market in which the usage of banknotes is uh, shrinking. Um, then I think there's no doubt the private sector will remain more innovative and, uh, and therefore should, you know, always be ahead maybe in terms of its uh, solutions to uh, the more, let's say, conservative or um, uh, central bank solutions and maybe the focus of the central bank solution on, on really core services, not, you know, pro uh, providing the whole um, set of value added services that the private sector is looking for. I think the central banks and the ECB in its report has been uh, clear that there's no ambition to take over the front end. So there's the idea that, you know, synergies with the private sectors should be maximized in terms of the uh, front end uh, solution. Um, and then um, also there's, you know, this question of will there be a shift of a balance sheet from commercial banks to central banks? when let's say massive amounts of deposits which are now with commercial banks would become you know would be shifted by holders of those deposits to uh, to become a digital euro and there again the central bank has no interest no ambition to see that uh, happening because uh, you know banks play an important role in the transmission of monetary policy they are the ones who are able to do uh, um, or to, or they are the experts in credit provisions. The central bank has no ambition to uh, substitute that. So the balance sheet of banks should certainly be preserved, and the functional design of CBDC has to include this, you know, possible tools to avoid that CBDC becomes such a success that it would crowd out in any way uh, uh, bank balance sheets. And uh, yeah, the idea is that CBDC, if uh, relying on, uh, on the private sector in its uh, distribution, in its front end, could uh, preferably be offered through supervised um, service providers. Obviously, you know, it's a, it's a tricky and responsible um, activity. And uh, yeah, it would be natural, you know, that this is left to uh, the supervised uh, parts of the industry. One maybe a crucial um, design question is the one account-based uh, versus bearer-based or token-based um, digital euro. So the idea is very simple. Account-based mean there's somewhere, you know, a central ledger which um, captures uh, who holds what basically and any transaction is recorded in the central ledger. While the bearer um, design would be, you know, much closer to the idea of a physical banknote that it is exchanged directly between uh, two holders, and there's no uh, central um, ledger recording of this. Of course, the um, the account based is uh, what you know is really tested and used. Uh, in the payments industry at all layers, from the central bank to the end user, in various you know va variants and layers, um, and for electronic payments, it's more obvious. It's, it relies on online payments to link everything, of course, to the central ledger. While the bearer is more uh, innovative, more tricky, and also in terms of security, of course, um, creates additional challenges. But here, really, the um, the uh, analysis is open-minded to both. So, in the next uh, phases of our investigation, we will continue to look at uh, at both options. Whereby, um, in my intuition, at least, the account-based approach will, um, in any case, play an important role, while the token-based, the bearer-based, can play a role in certain situations where you really want to have offline uh, ability. It's time to vote. So um, maybe Eileen can explain what uh, question is on the table. Yep. 
so on your right hand side, you will now be seeing the poll question. Uh, the question is, which approach to settle a digital euro payments do you find most appealing? A, account-based, B, bearer, C, a combination of both. So if you click your votes, you have 30 seconds to do so. Yeah, please, please vote. Um, please maybe vote. vote even more than during the panel. Yeah. So we have uh, 20 seconds left, and then we will show the results on the side. Yeah. When the time is up, the results appear. <laughs> so let's see. It's like uh, the winner of the Oscar. Everyone is excited now. We need to see. Do you see uh, the results, Aline? I no, they're, they're now there. they're there. Here they are. Okay. So you so see them, Ulrich, yeah. Yeah, quite a heavy participation. Very good. Yeah. So there is a majority for the combination of the two. Sorry that I spoiled uh, with my view also maybe the question, but um, I think that's uh, that's pretty plausible. Then there's uh, account based um, is uh, rank second, and bearer based is uh, the third ranked amongst participants. I think um, let's say tech um, or let's say people who who view uh, CBDC very much also in the context of uh, DLT of let's say fundamental innovation of uh, of ledger systems. They tend to sympathize, of course, also with a, a design which goes into the direction of a pure token. Um, and also people who like, um, you know, who who uh, emphasize the advantages of a decentralized, purely decentralized framework in terms of uh, privacy tend to sympathize, I think, with uh, bearer elements. OK, thank you. I can then uh, move on in my presentation. So here is just a list of uh, maybe more concrete um, features. How um, maybe I will close a link. So uh, how would uh, the digital euro look like uh, concretely? That's a good question. No. So for so, so far, I mean, we, it has to be worked out. But the intuition is that it will look like any other modern payment solution for point of sale and online payments. So if it can be embedded uh, into existing private solutions, that would not be uh, bad, of course. And then there's nothing speaking against, you know, having a very similar appearance of what the consumers know uh, from the electronic payments they are currently doing. Of course, it should be available throughout the entire euro area. It so, uh, should serve the needs of all segments of the population in a non-discriminatory way and curtail financial exclusion for the unbanked and for vulnerable groups. So the usability should have really in mind the entire population and efforts should be undertaken to achieve this inclusion. Of course, inclusiveness is not uh, free it's uh, costly to achieve it, but uh, that uh, that investment should be done. It should be uh, the digital euro should be mindful of privacy, and that of course is not limited, you know, to a bearer-based bearer uh, CBDC, but also an account-based one can uh, you know ensure privacy to a very large extent, and that of course is different from the uh, business models also of some private providers and payment services who have uh, realized uh, the value of uh, payment uh, information in uh, understanding individual consumers' uh, demand. So that is something that would be excluded for the digital euro. Uh, by definition, it would be risk-free central bank money, and it should be free of charge and for basic uses by payers. Again similar to um, existing forms of central bank money usable for citizens, um, namely banknotes. There's already again time to vote. 
So, Eileen, what is the next question? Yes, so the next question is on the screen. So this is a multiple question. Uh, also, multiple answers are possible, so you can click more than once. The question is, what is the most important feature that a digital euro should offer? A, pan-European reach, B, privacy, C, use with smartphone at the uh, payment terminals, D, use offline, E, additional no additional cost, F, use with the dedicated physical device. So here you can you can press more than one. You can uh, press as many as uh, yes. as you want. Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, okay. So if I would be um, if I would be you, I would uh, press everything. But <laughs> that is boring. So don't press everything. Don't press everything. <laughs> so as soon as the time is up, we will show the results. 20 seconds left. So oh, everyone is there left. clicking. Yeah. 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 So you can't think too much anymore. There is 10 seconds left. <laughs> okay. okay. Here we go. Let's see what the system. Here we are. Okay, it's uh, yeah. We have a winner. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, almost ranked. But the winner is a pan-European reach. Okay, the the audience is uh, European oriented. That's very good. Then we have next is uh, the use with uh, smartphones. Yeah, we are all uh, smartphone addicts, and we want to pay with smartphone. And obviously, biometrics uh, is I would say the you know, the big difference that smartphones also offer now in uh, payment convenience. So that's not uh, surprising. Then uh, privacy is ranked very high. Use offline as well, yeah. So, sorry, no, be precise. Next one is no additional costs. Then comes uh, use uh, offline. I think we are almost, you know, all of us are always online those days, but uh, we still dream of being offline sometimes. So that's why it would be nice to have a CBDC which works offline for 133 respondents. And then, yeah, the use with the dedicated uh, physical device is uh, not so popular. Yeah, a dedicated physical device, maybe we don't want to, to have one, no, we want to maybe use our smartphones and not be bothered with uh, with something in, adi in addition. That's um, so. That's a negative vote, maybe against a dedicated uh, device, which you know I think comes into play potentially for offline payments. No, but okay, maybe offline is possible without a dedicated uh, device. Okay, thank you. Then I'm coming, I think, uh, soon to the end. So uh, further assessment uh, is is needed again. It's a, it's a project uh, as as big as building Rome, almost. Though, no? um, hopefully not. So now uh, we have, uh, you know, the milestone. The the report was published, and uh, there are now, um, let's say, two in particular, two uh, work streams awaiting us, which is uh, a public consultation. And, uh, and further experimentation. And I think also uh, that's uh, maybe needless to say, conceptual work. And, uh, and some you know, conceptual work issues are listed here. Yeah? Um, so implications of CBDC for key areas of uh, interest, of course, for the central bank and, and for others uh, is uh, you know, the impact on monetary policy uh, the impact on on the economy, therefore, and on financial stability, and the financial system, the banking system. So that is uh, is a topic often mentioned, and you know the the objective is clear. Of course, CBDC must not, you know, put in question financial um, stability. It should not. Uh, of course, crowd out um, the private sector in any way. 
So there are clear, you know, already objectives formulated in the report, but uh, to be worked out exactly how those um, objectives are, um, are fulfilled through a functional design of CBDC. Then, uh, yeah, the question of uh, privacy, um, of uh, remuneration needs to be worked out. Then the already mentioned uh, technological aspects, like for example, uh, de uh, decentralized um, working versus a central ledger, the offline usage, but many, many other questions. So then uh, the public consultation, yeah. Um, the public consultation has been uh, launched, I think, was it on the 12th, uh, 12th of October? And it will run uh, for three three months. So I think it will end um, on the, is it 11th of January or 12th of, 12th of January, midnight, yeah? It will end and it uh, includes, it's on our website, everything is explained there. Uh, at the end, the answers have to be uh, given uh, online you have to register, and it it should really address uh, both uh, citizens and uh, and professionals. So everybody can answer all questions, of course, but some of the questions are probably more for more taking the citizens' perspective, and others are taking the the service provider, the um, financial industry perspective. So um, yeah, I think we we are very keen, of course, to get uh, input to really understand the requirements. I mean, from citizens, what are the user requirements from, from citizens? What is a desirable design? And from professionals, of course, ideas on, um, on technical solutions, ideas on the integration into existing uh, payment solutions. Yeah, we are, we are very keen to get any idea here uh, what uh, what will lead to to really efficient and user friendly um, solutions? And uh, yeah, then we have experimentation. So if uh, you know this is experimentation with uh, maybe a six months uh, horizon. So it is not you know experimentation probably with a large scale deployment of uh, CBDC to let's say citizens for certain uses as it is currently uh, taking place in, in China. We are not yet there, but uh, there's a lot to experiment to uh, check, you know, for scalability of solutions, for the possibility of offline, you know, there, there are various things. We also, you know, can check what our current uh, infrastructures that we have can possibly uh, contribute. As you know, we have uh, TIPS as a, an instant payment system so instant, I mean, CBDC is uh, by definition, you know, needs to be instant. So the question is, uh, is, uh, is tips, you know, uh, can that be an inspiration for a backend solution for um, CBDC? So, you know, various ex uh, experiments of, a, let's say, smaller or medium scale can be done to really um, move on, you know, in terms of understanding the technical options while doing in parallel more conceptual work and uh, collecting the uh, uh, citizens and uh, professionals' uh, input through the public consultation. So that's, um, that's what is currently then um, on the, um, let's say, agenda for the first half of uh, next year. And then uh, in mid-2021, the Euro system could, you know, consider whether to launch a digital uh, euro uh, project so to really move you know one step further and again it would be uh, launched to be uh, prepared so launching a digital euro project and uh, let's say investing the resources to really uh, become able to issue a digital euro should not be you know mixed with the decision to really issue the digital euro yeah so that decision is not uh, to be taken in mid-21, but the decision to launch a project which, you know, would allow us, or would allow the decision makers to um, one day decide to issue the digital euro. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And I understand, Eileen, we may have uh, questions. I don't see them. 
<laughs> I see that. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. So there are a number of questions. Uh, I, um, of course, I see the time, but maybe Ulag, you have a few minutes just to answer a few of them. Um, so there is one here um, that says, is instant payment in central bank money in essence, not already a transaction in central bank liability. The question is, of course, are they speaking about instant payments as instant payments and tips or instant payments as in RTGS? Yeah. So um, let's let's take instant payment in tips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, here from the perspective of the um, the uh, the citizen, the consumer, that is still, you know, a payment in commercial bank money. The, the settlement is um, then instantaneous in central bank money, but in terms of the claim of the bank um, to, um, to let's say, the central bank money pool in, uh, in target two. So it is uh, settled in central bank money, but not at the, the holder, the, the payer and the payee don't pay in central bank money. They pay really with... Um, commercial bank money. So if one would want to use uh, tips as uh, the basis, if you want the central ledger of uh, digital euro, then um, basically the citizens, the users would have to get uh, their own tips account in one way or the other. So that would uh, be something different. Excellent. Thank you, Ulrich. Um, there's another one here. What is the role of commercial banks for a digital euro? So is there a role for commercial banks if yeah if yeah the role I mean that uh, that um, that what that's you know implied by the idea to rely on uh, on the private sector in in particular providing the front end and of course uh, I mean who who has currently um, uh, most European citizens as clients, those are the banks. So, um, you know, customer identification um, until for, you know, AML, CTF purposes, um, that's all, you know, what banks are doing. And um, I think onboarding citizens to CBDC would, uh, would be much more feasible and efficient if it would uh, rely basically on the uh, bank, um, the bank relations with uh, with their customers. Of course, that does not need to be the only way to make uh, CBDC accessible. But in terms of uh, ease and scale, that seems to be an obvious choice. And of course, if the European banks, uh, um, you know, launch uh, EPI, deploy EPI, of course, you have then the economies of scale and efficiency from, again, a single payment solution that could, you know, have uh, then even more synergies with uh, CBDC. That would be a kind of uh, yeah, maybe most efficient scenario. But again, CBDC should probably not be exclusively linked, you know, to one distribution channel. But of course, uh, the, the bigger, the more efficient um, those distribution uh, channels are that can, you know, team up with CBDC, uh, the better, certainly. Excellent. Thank you very much. So maybe just one more, um, one more question. We have a lot here in here, but let's just take a last one. Could the discussion on CBDC digital euro create uncertainty that might discourage the industry from working on pan-European payment solution? Yeah, that that uh, the answer should be no, and we should do everything uh, that everybody agrees that the answer is no, because uh, as as mentioned, you know, we are talking about um, a further growing market, a gigantic market. No retail payments, electronic retail payments is growing and is also growing because uh, payment in central bank money in the form of bank notes gets gradually substituted by a digital payments no therefore you know the central bank entering this market does not imply the necessity for crowding out uh, private players and um, i mean that's that's a general remark and second there's the idea of uh, teaming up 
on the front end solution. And third, there's no ambition to substitute balance sheets. So all those things are very clear in the mind of the central bank. And we must, of course, uh, convince the private industry that therefore their investments into private retail payment solutions are, are fully deserved, yeah. Okay, Eileen, then yes. this would be it. No, no further questions. No, I think otherwise we can be here until tonight. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ulrich. It was very interesting uh, to hear all the insights on the possible uh, digital euro. And just to remind everyone on the date, as Ulrich mentioned, it is the 12th of January, 2021. Um, so before we close, I want to hand over uh, to Fiona, who has agreed to do the closing mark of today. So maybe Fiona, you are there. Over yeah. to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Aline. And uh, thank you also to Ulrich for that uh, interesting presentation on the digital euro. So uh, indeed, as the conference uh, comes to a close, I would just like to briefly reca recap on some of the highlights that we heard. Um, we started, uh, of course, uh, by looking at the challenges and also the opportunities of the digitalization of the European retail payments market. And uh, we have done so under the new normal that the COVID-19 pandemic has introduced. Uh, a situation which has shown us that which all shift in our face and made change of one and digital in a matter of just a few months. Now, I don't want to suggest that uh, we expect the European retail payments market to change towards uh, being 100% digital uh, so quickly, but still uh, it gives a sense of perspective in, in all of this. Um, Mr. Fabio Panetta, ECB Executive Board Member, started this morning by outlining the comprehensive response of the ECB to the changing payments landscape, uh, a response which consisted of four elements. Uh, first, our cash 2030 strategy, uh, which is to ensure that bank, bank notes remain widely available and also accepted as a competitive, reliable payment instrument and as a store of value. Um, our retail payment strategy, which is aimed at fostering pan-European payment solutions, an innovative European ecosystem for payments, as well as full deployment of instant payments. And then he also covered the ECB's approach uh, to act both as a catalyst and to foster and support change in the market, as well as uh, our role as an operator of pan-European uh, solutions, such as uh, target instant payment settlement service TIPS. Um, our new oversight framework was the third aspect that he covered. Uh, this is a framework covering electronic payment instruments, schemes and arrangements. Uh, the new framework will be called um, PISA and this will be released for public consultation in the coming weeks. Uh, and fourth, the possible launch of a digital euro that would both shape and promote the digitalization of payments, in turn supporting the digitalization and modernization of the European economy. And then following on from uh, Fabio's uh, speech, we had Commissioner Mairead McGuinness, who spoke about the Commission's retail payment strategy for the EU and uh, the different objectives that this wants to achieve. Uh, first being uh, the broad and diverse range of payments. Um, secondly, an objective for instant payments uh, to help reduce our dependence on the well-established players such as international card schemes and also more increasingly also on technology companies. And uh, third and finally, the fact that the Commission is committed to enhancing cross-border payments with non-EU uh, jurisdictions in order to make them faster, cheaper and indeed also more uh, convenient. And uh, I would like to thank in particular um, Ms. McGuinness uh, for agreeing to speak at our conference because, uh, as was mentioned earlier, she started in this role only last week on the 12th of October as the new Commissioner for Financial Services, uh, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union. Um, the two keynote speeches, they show the alignment and cohesion at European level and uh, highlight the importance of the efficiency of the European payments market and the sovereignty of the euro. Uh, we then had the panel discussion where stakeholders from the industry and the central banking side discussed concrete actions taken to achieve the basis for pan-European payment solutions and what is still needed for these solutions to be deployed and rolled out across Europe.
And we also heard the consumer perspective and what is important for the consumer in all of this. Um, during the panel, it became clear that there's a lot to be done and that this needs to be done quickly. And we have no time for complacency in any respect. Uh, but overall, the elements are there for a, a pan-European or more pan-European payment solutions. And there's a, a very definite momentum behind this uh, to go forward and uh, also, of course, to bring consumers and their needs with us throughout. Um, Afterwards, we had the presentation on a digital euro and uh, how it could impact the retail payments market uh, but from uh, Ulrich Binseil. Uh, the digital euro would be a new payment means, but it would not substitute front-end solutions to end users. Uh, therefore, understanding and collaboration uh, would need to be upfront and central, uh, which is why the ECB has launched uh, a public consultation on the digital euro report, uh, which will run until the 12th of January next year, as uh, Ulrich also mentioned. So this is uh, just a, a quick overview of the, the different aspects that were covered in the conference this morning. I'd like to thank uh, all our panelists and uh, presenters and speakers uh, for uh, guiding us through today. All of the participants in the audience who were very active with their questions. Unfortunately, as Aline said, we didn't have time for all of them, but uh, we will definitely be following up and uh, we look forward to having such sessions again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. This is the end of the conference today, so I just want to remind all of you that uh, the recordings of today will be uploaded on the ECB website after the event. So in case you are not able to watch the whole session, you'll be able to view it here. We also provide you with uh, how you can follow us and stay tuned on uh, new events or other news from the ECB. Thank you from my side as well. Thank you, everyone.